Yes, well, first, go, I have to go back in history on this because I was raised in Papua New Guinea until 1940, late 41, when the Japanese started bombing it. And we returned to Australia very quickly. But I lived in a region known as the Upper Water River. Um, it was a very dangerous place. The, it, we were right in the midst of people known as the Kuka Kuka. The Kuka Kuka were the, uh, uh, very well known as cannibals. And they had killed our neighbour, Bohm, a German man. And uh, our survival, very survival, was about awareness. You'd look at the kunai grass, which is 1.5 metres in height, and the kuka kuka was 1.49 metres. And you'd see the grasses moving like a snake, and you knew it was time to retreat back in, into, into the house, up into the higher level to command. It's always taking the higher ground. And the smell coming through, you could smell if the wind was blowing that direction. Or the weather pattern changes. Every day at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, roughly, you could smell the weather building up to the moisture for a cloudburst. And the rain would come down and tear things apart. And to observe a plane coming through, dropping our mail by, from, by air. This was genuine air mail, where you take a bag and throw it out the aeroplane and the mail arrives down in the grasses. To be aware of the snakes and the dangers and the scorpions and all those things in Papua New Guinea that were, for U European Australians, very tough going. But it taught me to look, to observe, to actually really see. And that is a critical thing for an architect, to observe, to look at a building, a beautiful building, and not just be, be romantic about this beautiful building, but to start to analyse why it is to you so beautiful. Is it about the structure? Is it about the detail? Is it about the light quality? Is it about the proportion? Is it, a, is it about space dimension? Is it about serenity? Is it about light factor? Is it responding to beautiful qualities of light? Does it have darkness as you enter and light as you go further into it? Like, like moth will go towards light. Hmm. Beautiful things, hmm. just beautiful things. that are. So you got, must analyse these beautiful things. And then when you understand them, you have the potential to actually start attempting to try and not replicate, but as you understand it, you develop a thing, develop it in your own way. That is absolutely the case. You see, I think we must be very critical of what we do. And so I, I do talk to myself when I'm designing and saying, am I achieving this? Am I achieving that? And I'm doing sections all the time. So it's a section, 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 or plan is also a section. And elevations, I'm not that interested in. I, in a sense, I do care, but in a sense, I don't care, because if I've if I have addressed the 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 section of the building, you saw an onion up there before, a section of an onion cut this way and a section of an onion cut that way. How would you know what an onion looks like without cutting it horizontally and cutting it vertically? That tells you about the onion. So if you are making an onion, if you were if you were whoever in this world has made an onion, the, the idea of the onion and planted the idea of an onion, then how would you know about it unless you cut it? Now, architecture is exactly the same. You have to keep cutting it, and you cut it at different levels, and you cut it at different places. And when you start to look at where the sun's coming in, what angle is it coming in, where does the air come through it, and does the air come from underneath the floor, should it be on the ground to capitalise on the thermal response from the ground when you go below Sydney, should it be off the ground when you get up to the area of north coast of 400 kilometres north of Sydney, so the air passes underneath and you get a free flow. Remember, air flows in lamina, 
you know, lamina way, and a meter off the ground is much hotter than three meters off the ground. So if you get out in a hot environment, get up off the ground, you get the, cl the clarity of the air, the, the smoothness of the, the flow, which is the same flow as water, water and air flow, and gases move all in the same way. These are beautiful things, so that if you start to understand the flow, for example, in that building there, the roof, the way it's shaped like that, is to get a negative pressure behind, so you can get suction in the building to take the air through the building. And this was all tested. You probably saw, saw them, the, the, the test modules on it to, in Victoria, and here they're, they're testing to see that there's a sufficient positive pressure and a, 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 a neg sufficient negative pressure because positive pressure moves to negative pressure and you have to get the differential to see that it's going to work, and it worked fantastically. And now this is going to be an Oakland Fossil Centre that, that, we're, that we're, my wife and I are doing. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But these are the sort of the log log logistics of the way of working. Yes, and so section is critical to my work. Mm. And it should be to every student. And you should be drawing by hand. We should come to that. And I can't believe it that, as a, as a profession, that we actually follow all these fashions. What's wrong with us? Don't we have a mind of our own to be able to pursue an idea, an ideal, to try and attempt at a level of integrity in the, in the work and to know that there are principles in architecture that have been laid down for centuries. It's, it's about understanding the placemaking is very important. So during these periods, I was just absolutely amazed by the very good architects that just shot off into postmodernism. What a stupid thing that was. I mean, <laughs> it's like lollipops. And it was, it was horrible time. And then constructivism. So what? Yes, well, you know, I'm very frightened of the word sustainability very frightened. There are very few things that are sustainable. Now, you might have seen on the slides here, Bougainvillean houses that are made of timber, the, the roof is of palm, the instruments are big logs hollowed out that drum in a very boom, boom, boom sound. And everything in that is sustainable. If you look at the Greek, look at the Greek islands, or you, you look at also the Anasazi people of the southwest of the United States, they all built naturally in a sustainable way. Now, there are things in architecture that are sustainable. Orientation is sustainable. So you orient your building in a way that it capitalizes on the winter sunshine and excludes the summer sunshine depending upon where you are on the planet. If you're up in 11 degrees south of the equator in the Aboriginal world, you don't need sun in the building any time of the year because the temperature range is only from about 30, 33 down to about 29. The difference is the humidity, so that's the factor you've got to work with. And in other parts of Australia, you're going to get entirely different logic for your, your work in sustainability. Now, the areas are also ab about how you put building together so that you can retrieve the materials without the loss of those materials. So nailing is hopeless for sustainability, but bolting is, is potentially sustainable because you can retrieve the materials. The screwing it can also be sustainable because you can retrieve it. Uh, uh, these are the sort of things. Ventilation can be is sustainable if you design a building that can ventilate beautifully. They're the sort of things that are sustainable. But when it comes to other materials, for example, brick and mortar, if you lay your bricks in cement mortar, it is no longer sustainable. But if you lay your bricks in lime mortar, as they did in, in around Australia in the uh, 1900s to 1915-16, then the lime mortar, after the, this period of time, the bricks can be taken down very easily. In my own house, I was able to, with a bolster, in two days, take off all the lime mortar off the brick. The brick was available for reuse. Put more lime in with the mortar that I'd taken out, and we reuse the mortar. That is potentially sustainable. But there is very little beyond that. You might think wool 
is sustainable as insulation. But you have to use chemicals largely to prevent the insect attack. So wool is not sust sustainable for insulation. Not to mention the damage the sheep have done to our landscape in, in the way they crap, crap under trees and piss over all over the place and the tree roots don't get the moisture and every, the trees die. So we've got landscapes with absolutely that are without trees as a consequence of the, of the, uh, of the sheep. And then the rabbit is the other one. Not to mention the human as another one that's damaged our country so badly. So I've been really interested in what is truly sustainable and recognising the things that I'm doing that are not sustainable and minimising those non-sustainable elements so that I can actually have a sensible building, not necessarily fully sustainable building. But the least we can do if a building has to be cooled and heated is to capitalise on those potentially sustainable elements so that we're able to minimise the actually loading on the building. Mm. So these are the sort of things that I have been very interested in. I understood how to run a very, very tight ship. Mm. And it allowed me the gift of time to develop ideas. I didn't have the overheads of staff eating the profits all the time and it allowed me to spend more time on every project so that I could understand the nature that was required in development mm. of that project. And I am very self-critical. I have lots of drawings I discard, lots of, of designs I discard. When I know, when I absolutely know it's not good enough, I get rid of it, I don't do it, but I don't throw the drawings away. I keep it because there's a lot of research done on my work and I want to show people that I can also be very bad. I can do some awful work, but it never gets built. <laughs> it only goes to the library as a record of showing how bad it can be and what you've got to do to get outside of that. That's a very significant thing. Also remember that in my, my time of building boats, I also worked with metals. So I was able to make all the metal components, all the stainless steel components, doing all the swages, everything on the boat I was able to build. All the stainless steel work was a wonderful thing to be able to achieve. And so to understand metals, to understand bricks, to understand wood, and understand the nature of all these materials, unless you understand the nature of materials, how can you put building together? Every, build, every material has its nature. As Louis Kahn said, what does it want to be? And it's absolutely the case. You've got to have a material that, that is, when you install it, it's working the way it's supposed to work, it is honest, it has its integrity, it's not a lie. It's not a fake. That's what's important. Mm. I love the idea, very old-fashioned idea, of authenticity. Mm. It's really significant issue. Now, with the advent of the computer, I can say that I have not witnessed very much architecture that I could say has improved immeasurably since pre-computer. And I think the computer has allowed us to get away with murder because people working on a screen have very overdeveloped uh, um, uh, confidence in the way details work. To understand a detail, you have to visualise it in, in three dimensions, in X, Y and Z coordinates, to know it actually has a corner to turn around. It has a junction at the top and a junction at the bottom. You, have, you need to visualise this. And in Johanny Palasma's book, The Thinking Hand, which every student of architecture and every architect should read, The Thinking Hand by Johanny Palasma, I don't have shares in his book. I have nominated his book 
maybe to 10,000 people to read over the years, regarded as the most important book for architects written in the last 30 years by the Guardian newspaper. And it is about how the mind and, and, and the eye and the hand connect and how you can actually develop an idea that you arrive at solution before you know what you've arrived at it. Professor George Steiny from MIT, has a, a, he's a computer programmer, he's a mathematician, and he has known for a long time that I, he talks about eye-hand thinking, and he has set a program where the computer can't get through. There are gates that simply can't get through. But he prints out this computer program, and when you do it by hand, you're through the gates before you know you're through. And how, how are you going to get a line like that, that I just drawn, and I can do that again there, and I can do it again there because I can see it. And I can put butter paper over it, over it, and over it, and over it, and I can then select that line and select it. These are really important things. And I can arrive at the, the, the nature of those lines in a split second. You can't do that elsewhere like that. You don't get the joy of it, the texture of it, the emotion of it. How do you get emotion out, out of a mouse? A rat trap. I don't know how you get emotion out of a mouse, but you can certainly get emotion out of a pencil. Beautiful line, beautiful quality. This starts to read, this starts to feel inside you. And I think it's this inside you that your mind starts to appreciate and starts to visualise what it's going to be. Mm -hmm. This is significant. Mm -hmm. It is beautiful. And the excitement that comes when the, the realise just like, yes, there it is. It's working. It's now really working fantastically. Right, I'm settled on it. And away you go. Mm -hmm. This is a wonderful time. Architecture is the most wonderful occupation if it's done this way. I can't think of any occupation that is so beautiful, that's so, so engaging and involving. It is totally every day, all day involving. And you can still be a human, I think, but I'll leave others to judge that. <laughs>
I sit down and I start analysing. All the way through, I'm analysing the work. Is it doing this? Is it doing that? Is it doing? Is, is it getting the wind in? Is it getting light in the right place? Is it going to be too dark there? Do I? Is it there? Is the room so dark that I need to put a window, vertical window, at the edge to actually get some light on that wall that will give the dimension of that space? Um, am I able to get very easy access? to the kitchen from there? Is the kitchen part of the dining space? Is the communication going to be right between these two? Is the dining space going to be part of, an, of the sitting space that looks out into a beautiful garden, a beautiful courtyard garden? If it's answering all these questions, if the section is answering all the questions, can I get the air in? If in my, in my semi, in a house that you saw here, which is at Wendy's and my house, my, my wife Wendy Lewin, who works with me in equal, equal capacity, uh, when we do things together, the ceiling comes along and then it lifts at the end because at lifting at the end captures more of the northern sky and I've got a beautiful jacaranda, or as they pronounce it in the, in the Spanish world, jacaranda, uh, and at this time of the year, November, it is the most beautiful colour, this mauve, blue, purple colour. And to have, the, have this window going up, and here it is right in my room, is fantastic. Now, I've done a section that shows this that with the jacaranda there and I've showed the jacaranda coming into the room. So the roof lifts for that. So the roof lifts because of that and I can see the sky and seeing the sky allows me to see the weather pattern changes, to see whether there's a storm building up. I can see whether there's a storm building up in the northwest or the southwest. This is wonderful to be able to see what nature's doing, how the planet is working. That's how I know when it's achieving all these things the questions I keep asking myself and I keep challenging myself. Have I achieved this? Have I achieved that? And if I haven't, I've got to go back and I've got to solve it. I'm very happy to solve it and recognise I haven't done it well enough. Does that answer it? Yeah. <laughs>